Psychology is a science that has evolved throughout history. Though many theories have become outdated, psychologists such as Wilhelm Wundt, whose achievements have been known as the stepping stones in establishing the science of psychology, and Sigmund Freud, who laid the foundation that led to psychology being recognized as an official field of science. Throughout this essay, I will explore the world's psychologists who made this field official, and will explore the history of the world's most famous psychologists. Not only will I explore the history of the science, but also the history of the lives of the scientists and the regions and the time period that they lived in. William Wentz was born in Neckarau, Germany on August 16, 1932. Both his father, who was a Lutheran minister, and his mother, who was close to 20 years younger than his father, raised him. At the age of 13, he was sent to boarding school, and at 19, left for university. He attended the universities of Tübingen, Heidelberg, and Berlin. In 1857, he began work as a lecturer at the University of Heidelberg. Afterwards, he became an assistant for psychologist Himmelsholt. A lab was set up for him at the University of Leipzig, where they set up investigations regarding the senses. Along with being an excellent researcher, Wundt was also an incredibly gifted writer. Reading all of his work has estimated to take about two and a half years if one was to sit and read 60 pages a day. The enormous amount of writing Wundt did also made it hard to criticize him. His arguments had often changed or he had revised an edition of a book by the time a critic was ready to present their criticism. Wundt had many students which resulted in him becoming a supervisor for close to 186 international doctoral dissertations. A main method that went to use to investigate psychology was to use introspection. Introspection is a process in which you study conscious experience. Before a student's introspection accounts were taken seriously, they would have to make around 10,000 introspection observations. Introspection is no longer used in modern psychology. The next psychologist in history that we're going to address are Joseph Brewer and his assistant, Sigmund Freud. Their first patient was named Anna O. Oh. She was a 21-year-old who was his patient from 1880 to 1882. She spent most of her life taking care of her ill father. Slowly, she developed a bad cold that had no physical evidence behind it. Then she developed speech difficulties and eventually became mute. When her father passed, she started to refuse to eat and developed an unusual set of issues. These include spasms, hallucinations, and paralysis. Brewer diagnosed her with hysteria, which is now referred to as conversion disorder. Hysteria is a condition in which you experience symptoms which appear to be physical, but are actually psychological. Every hysteria is the result of a traumatic experience, one that cannot be integrated into the person's understanding of the world. Eleven years after interacting with Anna O, oh, Dr. Brewer and Sigmund Freud wrote a book on hysteria. According to Freud, Brewer recognized that she had fallen in love with him and that he was falling in love with her. Plus, she was telling everyone that she was pregnant with his child. Though she was not actually pregnant, she developed a hysterical pregnancy. Because of these allegations, Brewer had to end the sessions with Anna O, oh, seeing as he was a married man. Anna, after being left by Dr. Brewer, went to a sanatorium. She left the sanatorium and became a very well-respected woman who was also the first social worker in Germany. She died in 1936, but she will not be forgotten because of her legacy of being the most influential personality theory figure that we've ever had. Sigmund Freud was born on May 6, 1856 in Freiburg, Moravia. His father was a wool merchant and his mother was significantly younger and had Sigmund at 21 years old. When Freud was around 5 years old, the family relocated to Vienna. He was a brilliant student and went to medical school, which is what every young intelligent Jewish boy in Vienna would do. He quickly became involved in research under the watch of psychology professor named Ernest Brooke. One of Freud's desires was to try to reduce personality to neurology, a cause which he eventually gave up on. Brooke helped Freud launch his career by setting him up with grants to work with the great psychiatrist 
Charchot in Paris and with Bernheim in Nancy. He later went and set up a practice in neuropsychiatry with Dr. Joseph Brewer and married his fiancée of many years, Martha Bernays. Years later, when Vienna became an unsafe place for Jews, especially those who were famous, Freud moved to England where he soon died of the cancer of the mouth and jaw. <laughs> idea of the conscious mind versus the unconscious mind, but he was responsible for making the idea popular. The conscious mind is what you are aware of at any particular moment. Your present perceptions, memories, thoughts, fantasies, feelings, what ha have you. The free conscious mind is memories, which you can quickly bring to the surface, also known as the available memory. But Freud suggested that these were the smallest parts of the mind's structure. The largest part is known as the unconscious mind. It is all things that are not made easily available. Things such as drives, instincts, and things in tra involving trauma that we don't remember. Alfred Bignet, Theodore Simon, and Carl Jung were all remarkable psychologists whose theories and research have greatly influenced the field of psychology. Now, not only am I going to address their personal histories, but also I will carefully examine exactly how they changed the science of psychology and methods of testing within the science. In order to fully understand something, you have to comprehend where it came from. The history of IQ tests is important because it helps us understand how we should interpret the test and the result it provides us. During the 1900s, the French government had a law passed that required all children to attend school. Because of this new law, it was crucial for the government to have a technique to identify which students required extra assistance. To solve this problem, the government hired Alfred Bignet and his colleague Theodore Simon. They developed various questions that tested their attention, memory, and problem-solving skills. Early in their quest to categorize children by their intelligence, they noticed that the younger children were answering questions that older children were able to answer. This observation led to the theory of the This observation led to the theory of the mental age, or a measure of intelligence based on the average abilities of children of a certain age group. The questions they formed created the first intelligence test, also known as the Binet Simon scale. Though he believed that this would help solve the issue of sorting children by intelligence, he also stressed that intelligence is far too broad a concept to quantify with a single number. The intelligence quotient, also known as the IQ, is a single number that represents the individual's score. Dividing the test taker's mental age by their chronological age and then multiplying this number by 100 calculated the score. Despite the test's numerous revisions, the test is still a popular assessment used in psychology. Alfred Bignet, the master behind the intelligence test in the Bignet Simon scale, was born in Nice on July 11, 1857. He was an only child and his parents divorced when he was young, which led to him moving to Paris with his mother. He was extremely introverted and self-educated by reading books and by authors such as Ilona J. Horanegish, Simon Voiteros, and John Stuart Mill. He was especially interested by John Stuart Mill, who believed that intelligence and its operations could be understood by the laws of associationism. Binet graduated, graduated with a law degree in 1878 and planned on going to medical school, but after years of self-educating, decided that he was more interested in psychology. In 1883, he began to work at the self Salpetriour Hospital in Paris, side by side with John Martin Charchot. Though he supported his teacher's studies specifically on hypnotism, he later discovered that his theories were not scientifically based and publicly announced that he and his mentor were indeed wrong. After this incident, his daughters were born, which sparked his interest in child development. Bignan's research with his daughters helped him to further his developing conception of intelligence, especially the importance of attention span and suggestion or and suggestively in intellectual development. In 1890, Bignet resigned from La Sepultura and began research on the development of cognition in children with Theodore Simon. Following this exploration, he began his research again with Theodore Simon, resulting in the first IQ test. Along with studying children, he also studied chess masters in their memory. He did this by blindfolding the players and seeing if they could play from memory. Vignette concluded that extraordinary feats of memory, such as blind chess playing, could take a variety of monomnic. He recounted his experiments in a book entitled Physiologie des Grandes Calculatures et Jouets de Chez. Alfred Vignette died on October 18, 1911, but since his death he has been honored multiple times.
Theodore Simonson is famous for being Binet's colleague and also the helping hand in the creation of the first IQ test. But most people in, psychi in psychology do not recognize him for his expansive knowledge and involvement in the field. He was born on July 10th in Dijon, France. He spent his childhood completely intrigued by Binet's work. In 1899, he became an intern at the asylum in paris Vaucluse, where he began his famous work on abnormal children. Simon worked in a wide variety of hospitals and asylums until 1905 when the first IQ test, or the Binet Simon scale, was created. Even though the scale was corrected twice, once in 1908 and once in 1911, Simon kept it the same after Binet's death out of respect for him. He continued his work in hospitals from 1905 to 1920 and then was retired until his death on 1960. Carl Jung is one of the most important figures in psychology and greatly influenced it as a science. He was born on July 26, 1875 in Keswell, Switzerland. He was the son of a Pro Protestant clergyman and his mother was an evangelical Christian. His mother claimed to see ghosts and claimed to be connected with death. So due to his mother's psychiatric instability, she was eventually sent to a sanatorium. His father suffered from depression and many other psychiatric disorders. Young's parents created an extremely unstable situation for him, which led to a very isolating childhood. Later, his father passed away in 1895 and left his family completely broke. But despite this, he managed to go to school at the university. But despite this, he managed to go to this school at the University of Basel and graduated in 1895. He then went to the University of Zurich, where he obtained his MD in 1902. His dissertation was titled "On the Psychology and Pathology of So-Called Oculate Phenomenon." This was research and observations based on data collected from his cousin who suffered from multiple personality disorder. After, public, after this publication, he married Emma Rochenbosch on 1903. She came from an extremely wealthy family, which made Young financially stable enough to continue his research. Emma and him had five children, Agatha, Greta, Franz, Marianne, and Helen. Despite having five kids, he continued his research and soon collected enough and built up his reputation to land a job at a mental hospital with Dr. Brewer. At this hospital, he had an affair with his first patient, Sabina, the Russian princess, and they sent letters to each other for years. Because of the affair, Young's wife thought that there was something wrong with her. Not only did Young agree with her, but he also insisted that he analyze her and allow him to attempt to solve the problem with her. After years of cheating, Young finally ended the affair after he had a dream that the affair was damaging his career. In 1906, Young finally publicly announced that he supported Freud in his use of psychoanalysis. The next year, in 1907, Freud and Young finally met. They discussed a wide variety of topics within psychology for 12 hours straight. After this meeting, Young began an experiment with experiment with a colleague, Alfred Adler, but unlike Ad Young, Adler did not agree with Freud's theory that, se that psychosexual Libido was the all-powerful force. Adler instead theorized that the drive of all, power, of all force was power. Because of this lack of agreement, Young had a decision to make. Agree with the colleague and a partner in an experiment, or agree with the highly recognized and well-written acquaintance. Young eventually publicly announced that he agreed with his colleague, Alfred Adler, which greatly impacted his reputation negatively. After announcing his support for Adler and losing some credibility, he decided to leave for self-exploration. He left in 1913 and did not return for six years. Young spent his time attempting to understand fantasies that he had been having. Along with this, he wanted to learn to cope with things that had surfaced from his unconsciousness over the years. He did this by spending hours on end involved in ancient yoga and meditation. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to completely understand his fantasies and images that he had emerged. But he did manage to write a book that wasn't published until 2009 called The Red Book. In the prologue, it says, to be the superficial observer, it will appear like madness. IQ test and the Briggs-Meyer test, both of which are widely known. It is important to understand history of whatever you are studying because it makes the present understandable. I am excited to begin my journey of studying psychology. I find myself constantly impressed by the extensive amount of research that be can be conducted on the subject. Also, I find the history of psychology fascinating, especially the theories, because these will be continuously implied while I'm in college and while I'm a psychiatrist. Thank you.